on this episode of Real Life and Fishing, we're having a guest that I've had a lot of people ask me about, like, when are you going to have Johnny on? When's Fish the Moment going to be on? Guys, we finally got it. I wanted to do an episode with Johnny in person. I didn't want to do it over the internet, man, so it's taken us a little bit, but perfect time to do it. We filmed this at our Airbnb where we stayed at for the Bass Master Classic. Just had a great event. Had a good time there at the uh, Classic. I was there all three days, and man, it was an experience. Uh, it was just crazy. I could talk talk about it. Just as many people as I met, got to talk to fans, people that watched the, uh, the My Fishing Coach YouTube channel, all the YouTube channels. I mean, like I said, I had a few people even ask me, hey, you've not posted a podcast in a while. And guys, I've been behind. I'm sorry. Um, I, I got lined up. I had one with uh, Jeremiah Kendi, but we kind of had some c- uh, conflict schedules, and we're going to get it done. Like, I'm getting one with Buzz Sawyer. I uh, met some other guys at the Classic and try to get them up. But, man, with my business lately, is uh, my guide business has kind of gotten the way. It's kind of been crazy, and it's uh, kind of putting some other things kind of on a pause. But we're here, and I got other ones getting, like I said, I'm, I'm not done with the, the podcast. going to keep going. I might just throw three up real quick. You never know, guys. So just always be looking and, and watching. There's been a lot of tournaments, I know, in Arkansas. I know we talk about the Arkansas tournaments. Uh, Greer's was last weekend. I don't even know who won. I think 14 pounds won. Or uh, Swazi won. Justin. Justin won. I don't know, Justin. Congrats to you. Uh, I believe he's a Garden guy. I think he's a South Southwest Arkansas guy. So uh, he's had a couple big wins recently. And that was now an, another big win for him. So congrats to you, Justin. And like I said, been a lot happening since the last podcast. A lot of tournaments. And Classic was a good one as well. And um, And guys, on this one, I'm not going to talk as much. I'm, I'm just going to let this thing roll on this one. Uh, I did the best I could. We had some technical glitches on my previous one with Bo that I filmed in person. Nothing went wrong. On this one, after I got the footage and, and went to edit it, man, one of the mics was messing up. And then, you know, there was a part where, like, it just didn't work. I don't know why. So, uh, or like, Johnny was talking about core tackle, and it just kind of went silent. So I'm going to fix that, you know, and... Uh, and I, and I try to do my best I can fixing it. Like I said, it, it still sounds okay, but it, it should be better. So I'm still playing with it. We're just letting this thing roll, guys. So it's going to it's gonna happen. But me and Johnny went through a few stories, how uh, we became friends and uh, shared some fishing experiences, how Fish the Moment came about, how Core Tackle came about, man. And uh, So, guys, before we get into the podcast, I just want to say thank you to Future Marine for being a part of the podcast. Guys, Future Marine, three locations across the state. And they will serve you in any of your marine boating needs. I know recently, guys, if I've told you about my electronic lessons, there's been other boats I get in with clients. And these other marine dealers set their boats up. And I've been disappointed when I get in them. Because there could be this battery wrong or this or this. Guys, I know at Future Marine, down there in southwest Arkansas, Trent Owens will be the guy, uh, Trent and his team. Trent's just been there the longest. But Trent... Uh, I trust in setting up electronics, and he's a fisherman. I mean, he fishes as much as, and he don't fish as much as he used to because he's got kids and family, but he still fishes tournaments. Trent actually got second recently at the Mr. Bass of Arkansas, uh, the last uh, Mr. Bass of Arkansas at Washita. He had second, had a big fish on the day, and then he won the day before in the Rusty Hook. So Trent's an angler, and there's a lot of guys that set up these boats that don't fish. They just set them up. So it's, for me, I love trusting a guy that I know that's on the water, okay, a lot. Because he gets to use the equipment, he gets to tinker with things how it are, and he wants to do the best he can for you. Another guys, another new sponsor on the show, Generation 3 Auto. They're on Military Road. Go check it out, Generation 3 Auto. I just got me a set of tires recently from them, guys. And I normally run a set of tires that's a more popular brand. And my man Brady Butler there, he actually gave me the opportunity to do this other set of tires. I mean, I can get whatever I want. But he was like, hey, man, trust me on this. You have a longer warranty. I know where they're made. They're a great product. And so, guys, I one thing about him with any car dealer, I trust him. But for you guys, like, I fish. I know a lot about fish and tackle. I mean, I got fish and tackle all on this bucket right here and stuff over here. One thing about, like, for me, an auto dealer, that dude does that for a living. Brady's one that's done it for a living. He's done it since he was like, I mean, eight, nine years old. That's why it's called Generation 3 Auto, his dad, grandpa. So it's someone I can trust, and I want you to go out there and get opportunity to trust as well. All right, let's do this thing. Johnny, 
This is like the third cut, oh, guys. Oh, yeah, <laughs> here we are. Okay, we're here, guys. It's nine, what, third four fifty at night, and we're filming this podcast right now. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I got my man Johnny Schultz. So many stories we're about to talk about, and let this thing just kind of roll as it is, as this is our third third cut. But thank you for doing this right now. Thanks for having me. And I know I would not be here if it wasn't for you giving me the opportunities you have. Well, man, you're the man. We've been fishing together since we were. Little kids doing the junior fishing. Apologies for the peanut gallery in the back. We got uh, Core Tackle House, a little bit rowdy in the background, yeah. so apologies over here. But Jimmy's been a good friend of mine for years, and we fished together the junior tournaments. We did all, all kinds of different lakes around the Little Rock area and kind of learned to do a lot of the offshore fishing, a lot of just fishing in general together. So it's really cool to be able to work with you. Jimmy's now editing a lot of the Fish in the Moment content, has his channel, Bass Fishing Declassified, and he's, he's all over the game. So uh, really like I said, you, you, you gave me the chance, but uh, let's talk about one. There's a couple fish stories I want to bring up and like okay. stuff we've talked about learning. And like even today at the Classic, I heard a cool story. That's just that I want to bring up that story, but like us fishing, the one when the one stories we laugh about. There's a lot of stories. I want you to share it from your point of view, the beaver fork one. Okay, so no, let's go into that. This is this is when I was first learning to ledge fish, right? Yeah, hundred so percent. I just got my Triton. Yep. I'm still running it. This yep. Was, when I, this was 2010, probably at this point. No, it was sooner than that. I was uh, a a. 2009. 2009. So it's 2009. Yeah, 2009. I'm putting it in my head right now. In this old Triton, 2005 Triton, we had 2D sonar. That's it. That's all we had, and it was what came stock with the boat. Yep. So we were in a situation where I was running, this is black and white 2D sonar. Black and white. And I was graphing out here on this lake, no contour maps, no Navionics, Beaver Fork Lake over in Arkansas in Conway. So we're graphing over these areas, and I'm like, Jimmy, I want to go catch these fish offshore. We're going to go find these offshore fish. Mm-hmm. We're watching Kevin Van Dam catch yep. them on the Tennessee River with a side imaging. We don't have side imaging. We don't have con- <laughs> We don't have any. We had, a, we had a 6XD, though. We had, six we had 6XDs. So what we did is we drove over this roadbed, and I was told through the grapevine that there's a roadbed on this lake. Well, I didn't know what that meant. And I was just told, graph out there in the middle, you'll find something. Good luck, kid. Okay, great. Thanks. So yeah. I do this. We get there, and we see this rise on the 2d i'm like oh there it is jimmy we got it we didn't know what we were doing though so we had marker buoys marker buoys. and we dropped like four marker buoys down this road mm-hmm. and we didn't that was the only way we knew where to cast and we get up there and i pick up a 6xd and i fire out there maybe 10 or 12 casts and i hook one and i catch it and it's like a four pounder yeah and it's pretty good and i fire back out there i catch another one catches another one fire back out there Catch another one. Guys, I'm making casts, by the way, and not catching fish between this. And then the famous clip, which was still on my Facebook page years later. It's still on there somewhere. It's, it's, it's on there. I cast out there. I hook a fourth, like, three-pounder. Yep. Jimmy, at this point, just net man. I'm net man and frustrated. <laughs> and his, he's trying to get the net open. We're collapsing it. He undoes the net. He has one net in this hand and the other piece of net in this hand. He's scooping it like this. And all he says is, gosh, Jimmy, you suck again. Yes. He's like, you're like, why can't I catch one of these dang fish? Yes. And it was, my mom was in the boat with us. Yes. That was 14, so I couldn't even drive yes. my boat to the lake. Uh-huh. And so my mom was like in tears, crying a lot. Yes. And she thought it was so funny because you were just so mad. You're like, I want to catch one on this crank, man. What and I Johnny, doing, I caught two fish that day, I think, and you caught like 10 or 11 yeah. on that crankbait. And guys, we had days like this. Like oh, yeah. the, it was either one or the other. A lot of times it was Johnny, I was over here. But like, yeah, that was just one of those moments to where I don't know, I, it was funny. It's just one of those days. But guys, we literally. That's how we learned how to offshore fish. Like, yeah. it was crazy. Now, I'm going to go to, because you've found a way to make it in the fishing industry without being a professional tournament angler. I remember you sharing with me what Earl Bentz told you. You got to see Earl today. Yeah, talked to Earl for about an hour, almost an hour and a half probably today. What was just that little insight he shared to you when you was a young kid, and it somehow stuck with you, and then he shared that with you today. Yeah. It was cool for me just to kind of rehear it, because I remember guys like, so as you said earlier, his mom and dad were very influential on you. They supported you, took you to the tournaments. Guys, y'all have no idea. Like, they didn't bass fish either, by the way. 
I'm looking at the computer, and you look at the camera. They didn't even bass fish either, by the way, guys. But they supported Johnny in what he did in your hobby that turned into your life. But what did Earl share with you? Yeah, so I actually I met Earl Benz, Bassmaster Classic, 2003. Yeah. So this is now 21 years I've been going to the Classic this year. Mm -hmm. And basically... Well, it's a funny story with Earl. So I just won this Casting Cage National Championship, yep. right? The first or second one? First one. Okay. So I was eight years old. There was this thing called Casting Kids back in the day where you cast at this target, and there's these circles on the target. And so I won that, and right afterwards, I was swept off the stage or swept off the competition floor and put on the stage of the Bassmaster Classic Stadium in the Superdome before Hurricane Katrina hit it, the mm -hmm. old Superdome. And I was up there holding this trophy. My mom and my dad had no idea where I was because these guys just grabbed me. I was casting on the floor of the Superdome where they drove the boats, got me up on stage. Then they took me backstage. My mom found me. And then I was getting escorted out into the main expo. And before my dad could even find me, Earl Benz came up to me. He's like, son, really like what you're doing. We need to get you fitted out with a Triton jersey. <laughs> and so he then takes me with my mom into the back of the Triton Boats trailer. They used to have these giant trailers where they have merch and everything. And they gave me this shirt. And it was like a button-up shirt like this. And it was the extra small because I was eight years old. And it went, like, down past my knee. Uh -huh. And they had me in this Triton shirt, and I was all tucked in. I was super excited. My dad was like, where did my wife and my kid go? We have no idea where they are. And, like, then my mom called him, and they're like, okay, we're in this, this deal. And we get out. And Earl's like, well, I'm going to make you the first sponsored kid ever in fishing. And so he got that jersey on me, and I was on the Triton Pro Staff when I was eight years old. And I knew Earl for years, worked with him, did stuff for Mercury, did the hog tank, all this stuff. But he told me when I was like 12, 13 years old, he's like, hey, I see you're getting really interested in the bass fishing and everything. But he's like, if you want to have a good life and enjoy it, he's like, find a way to work in the fishing industry and make money in the industry, in the business side, not in the fishing side. He said, the happiest you're going to be is if you can make it in the industry from a business side and fish when you want. You don't want fishing to become your job because if fishing becomes your job, you're going to be to the point where you hate fishing or you're not going to enjoy mm -hmm. fishing and you won't want to fish for fun. And he's like, he's seen it with so many people. It's not a good way to make money, to become a pro. And this was when it was really good. This is when, like, Sit Go Gas, Dude, like, was, yeah. all these big sponsors were in the industry. Bowden, boat, everything was going up. This was pre-2007 recession, you know, all that yeah. stuff. So he was way ahead of that, and he said, if you want to make it a good life while being in this industry, do something other than being a pro. And that's kind of what I did. I took that, you know, that lesson to heart and went and got my MBA, did all that stuff before I ever got back in the industry and kind of found my own niche to kind yeah. of get into and, and i remember so like that niche that first niche started with youtube and i remember when you started your channel and i, I actually remember you telling me dude you need to do this and i was just like nah <laughs> and part of that was guys that like i kind of i say it like my pride kind of got in the way i was like dude, i thought about people what they would think of me this and you never had that like that's one thing like you didn't care you just did your thing and there's other youtubers that are now very successful that have done it for a long time, like you, that had that I don't care. And when I first, you first brought me on Fish the Moment, which was crazy, guys. This dude put me on a YouTube channel with 150,000 subscribers and said to go make content. And I was so much caring about what people thought. And then I saw that I wasn't me. And then when I said, forget it, I'm going to be me and roll. Dude, I got so much comfortable with the camera. I was better. But that's one thing about you from the get-go. You just didn't care. And you went started doing the thing of... I'm going to go catch fish and show you everything about it. What led you to that? Well, so, like, I knew I was coming out of, literally, I was making my videos when I was in my MBA program. So, yeah. Business Administration, University of Arkansas. And I actually fished college fishing. I won a college regional championship. Yep, a big one. And did really well. I fished one more regionals after that, and I called it quits. You did? I put my boat in the garage for two years. Uh-huh. I didn't touch it. It sat in the garage gathering dust. You came and fished with me on Washington. We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. And that kind of got you fired back up. Got me fired up. So, so the boat's in the garage, though. And then I just started bank fishing. Yep. I literally put a chest camera on, 
because my I had a camera that I was filming with when I was in college, and I'm like, I'm just gonna go throw a chest camera on just in uh-huh. case I get some cool shots or whatever. And I'm just gonna go fishing, and I started loving it. And I yeah, I did a little bit of fishing. And I went to an internship in Ohio, so and I right. couldn't go do anything. I came back, and I'm like, I'm gonna make some YouTube videos because I'm watching these guys like John B, Lunkers TV, and I'm like, these guys, they're making these videos, they're getting these views, but they're not teaching anything. They're just fishing, and like, there's not a lot of good instruction out there. So I started doing some videos from the bank, you learning did. to edit, stuff like that. And if you go back to my YouTube channel, Fish the Moment, my first like eight videos are all me fishing from the bank. I had a boat, yeah. but I'm bank fishing. So then I got out in my boat finally. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get the boat out of storage, make sure the engine's still good. It's all good. And I went out to the lake. And within my first two or three videos, I realized people really love when I showed my electronics, and they loved when I showed the mapping. And I was like, I have nothing to lose. Because I'm not fishing tournaments anymore. I can give all the juice. I can give exactly what I'm doing. I spent, I fished 128 tournaments from the age of 8 to the age of 18. Wow. So I fished a lot of tournaments. Yeah. And my, my dad kept track of all that. He actually had an Excel spreadsheet of every finish I had, the number of fish I caught, all that stuff. So he was really analytical too. And so I had a lot of tournament experience. I had a lot of like knowledge of the electronics game. Did really well in high school and college fishing but then I was so disconnected from it that I didn't care if I gave up on I gave up all my info yeah I think that really helped me when I was getting into it is because I'm not a pro I'm not winning classics I'm not fishing lead series all I can show people is hey I caught three four pounders right here this is exactly what it looks like on the side imaging here's what it looks like on a contour map here's the bait I threw if you want to go replicate it you can go do it and if you don't believe me, go try it yourself. And a lot of people have tried it, yeah. and they've caught fish doing it, and I think that's why I've been able to be yeah, successful. Yeah, like, so, like, even today, it was cool for me. Like, people coming up to me and, like, hey, I watch your YouTube. I had, like, a few people. But you and Matt over there, y'all being in this longer, how many people came up? And, like, we even talked about, like, Matt, like, how many people came to him and autographs. And, you know, and so it's you know, done it longer. It's cool to have that connection with people you don't even know. They feel like they know you. That's why I learned. Like they feel like they know me, but I don't know them. Now we're gonna go. I'm gonna share about that Washita trip. <laughs> so guys, I remember Johnny. I was living in Stuttgart, Arkansas, and this is kind of crazy. So this day was cold, very cold front weather. There was actually the same day we're out on Washita. There was duck hunters that got caught in it, and I think they passed. Like I remember because when we're on Washita, it was cold, rainy, uh, sleety, and we had no cell service. And, like, your dad couldn't get a hold of us. Your mom, my girlfriend, which is now my wife, couldn't get a hold of us. People were panicking. (laughs) They were were not happy. They were panicking. So we start off at the state park, guys, and we're in the 17-foot Skeeter. We weren't in his boat. We're in the 17-foot Skeeter. Remember that day we launched off the road in the back of the Navy boat? No, 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 we did. So we start off in the state park. Oh, the state park, that's right. We start off in the state park, and it was not any good. And we were going to run to Blakely because I've been fishing Blakely a lot. I told Johnny about it. And... But then we go to take off to the main lake, and dude, guys, it was so windy. That's right. That's and that right. 17-foot skeeter, I was scared. Like, guys, it was six-foot whale swells. I was scared. I turned the boat around about sunk the boat. Roger, if you're listening, I'm sorry. The boat was okay. I know. It's all good. We came then back to the state park, drove to Navy. Guys, in the lake, I didn't realize how high the lake was at that point. No. We launched from, the like, the road, like, in Navy. Like, we launched, and, like, there wasn't much of a ramp. It was muddy back there. I still got GoPro footage, by the way, of this. Like, I got photos, too. Like, we, we, we were back there in Navy, muddy high water. Johnny caught a fish on a jig right off the bat, yep. flipping. And then we started flipping, and Johnny looks at me and was like, dude, I don't want to do this. Let's go find fish in the grass. I'm like, yeah, dude, that's why we came over here, right? So then we went back out to the lake, and that's where we found one of our juice spots. That's, that, this is the beginning of the juice spot. I mean, I caught two out of it, but you caught the five and a half and six and a half? Yep. I mean, dude, like, bam, bam. And we had a bag, ended up having a bag. Real good bag. And then we, you know, we, we, we did some other stuff, caught some fish, came back to the, the truck. We had no service. And we're fired up. I mean, guys, we're fired up. Then we finally had cell service. So it was a bad deal. Your parents were upset. My <laughs> no girlfriend. My girlfriend's mad at me. Her parents are mad at me. My dad's mad. Everybody's mad at us because they thought we, because of, of the duck hunters, like I said, sadly, something happened to them with the conditions, and here we are 
But anyway, we're just still fired up that we had a day. Like, we just had a we day. We didn't even know. We're yeah. just making it happen. And so, uh, and then I remember that trip. You went back, you know, because I think you just came back down from Ohio. Yeah. Because that was duck season. You came down from your internship. Yep. And then you got the boat out. Yeah. So, I I, it yeah, man, it was great. It was great. So. It's, it's really weird how all that, that stuff kind of works. Because, like, when I, when I started the YouTube channel, I had no expectations. I didn't think I was going to make a career out of it. I was just like, I like making videos. I like teaching. I made videos for two years. Yeah. And I was putting 10 to 20 hours into every single video I made for two years. And I didn't get to over like 2,500 subscribers until after the two-year mark. And this was while I was doing my MBA. I was working 20 to 30 hours a week as a demand forecaster for Nestle with the Walmart account. And... I was then doing the YouTube channel. So I was basically like doing three things, like three pretty intense things all at once. And then I just kept doing the YouTube stuff. I was like at 5,000 subscribers when I finished my MBA. And I started corporate and I just did not enjoy my job. I didn't enjoy the grind, the monotony of it. I just, it wasn't what I was really feeling. I don't know, I I didn't really enjoy it. So I was doing the YouTube stuff kind of as an escape. Mm -hmm. I was just like, I like doing stuff on the weekends. I like hanging out fishing, doing that stuff. And for whatever reason, the channel started exploding. It, yeah, it took off. Took off from like 5,000 to like 30,000 subscribers. And then at that point, I was dating my now wife, and she was in my ear like, hey, this is making, this is, this is becoming a thing. You should think about doing a full-time career of doing this fishing. And I'm like, ah, I don't think I can do that. I'm, I don't, I don't want to risk a good salary. I was making good money. I was a manager in corporate. Like I had a good ca- career trajectory. And after a while, I started thinking about it, and I'm like, okay, how could I make money in fishing? And I'm like, if I'm going to do this, I need to create 10 to 12 revenue streams. And I need to be really confident I can make money in like 10 or 12 different ways. And I laid out a spreadsheet of how this worked. And I had my dad helping me, and he would text me every day at work. He would have all of these different revenue yeah. streams that we would think of. And we, day by day, won two, mm-hmm. three, we would figure it out and we got to 10 and we're like, man, even if half of these revenue streams fail, I'll still make just as much money as I'm making in corporate right now. Yeah. So I started and I'm like, I'm going to boot up four of them. In two months, I was making as much per month as I was in my corporate job. In four months, I was making almost twice as much as I was making in corporate. And I'm like, this is crazy. I, I don't know what's going on here, but something just kind of worked yeah. out there and uh, had a lot of great support from me and my family, my parents. Yeah. My now wife, like without them, I would not be doing any of this. I would be, I don't know what I'd be doing. I got my, my parents got me in the boat, got me in the boat with a bunch of random people and the yeah. junior tournaments, things like that. Not random people, but yeah, like yeah. people I get out with, you know, they sacrificed a lot. And mm-hmm. then, you know, my wife, she sacrificed a lot to help me get where we are now. And it's not like it was ever easy. And it wasn't like it was a lot of work. I was doing 40 hours, 50 hours of work a yeah. week in corporate. And I was editing and filming 40 hours a week fishing. So working 80, 90, 100 hour weeks. But it all worked out in the end. Yeah. So. And now and now even like you were always a bait twinkler guy. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, guys like, so he, he's talking about this. And I remember fishing with you right after your dad passed and my mom passed in January 2020, right before COVID hit, guys. And Johnny was like, hey, dude, I'm about to quit my job. I'm like, what? And you're like, dude, I'm quitting it, and just get ready. You're going to come work for me one day. And you started talking numbers and this and that, and I'm just like, what? <laughs> what in the world? No, I'm coaching forever. And then, you know, I always knew you are a bait twinkler, and then you quit your job, boom, boom, and all of a sudden you had your jig with Jewel Bates, the Fish Woman Offshore Jig. Yep. And then, you know, now you have Core Tackle. But even before Core Tackle, you and Matt were, you know, working through Fish the Moment. And I remember when August or September, you brought me. There's Matt. Matthew. Is that thing on? Yeah, it's on. Oh, sorry. You're good. Matthew. So, yeah, I remember, <laughs> I remember September. I just started working for you, and you and Matt met. And then you were back there talking about all this stuff about hooks, this and that. And I'm just like, time out. Like, what do y'all, you know, and all of a sudden, here's, I next thing you know, you, you send me a hover rig in the mail. You're like, catch fish with this. So now we have core tackle, and it's where it's at now. Like, just talk a little bit, I mean, just anything you want to share about it, because uh, 
I mean, it's it's going pretty like people were just guys from me. I know a lot of my guys watch me, like they know, but like anybody catches fish with this stuff. Bang fishermen, non live scope fishermen, live scope fishermen. Y'all made a product where anybody can use, and people trust y'all through your YouTube channel of buying a catch fish with it. So the core tackle story is kind of crazy. So Matt, Matt and I, we talk business all the time. We were working together for Fish in the Moment. Um, he was doing like breakdowns and virtual lessons. We're always like, how do you make more revenue streams? How do you keep good stuff going? I'm always thinking like two steps ahead of like this revenue stream is going to go away, so I need a new revenue stream. I need to think ahead, future-proof the business. So I thought baits would be a good avenue. And when we were kind of going through it, I'm like, okay, what could we do with baits other than, you know, I was working with Jewel at the time doing some things like that. And those worked out well, but I didn't have control as much over the product as to like make it consistent. So I was sitting in my boat one day and I was talking with Matt and I was like, Matt, would it be crazy if we just like made baits? And he's like, what would we make? And I'm like, well, let me make something up real quick. And I had this idea for a long time of a swim bait head where you put all the weight inside the swim bait. Yeah. And there was a couple other hooks that were kind of, there was like an old sluggo hook that you could put the weight in the bait, but it was a straight shank. It was big. It was heavy. It just didn't really work well. So what I did is I took my fish to moment offshore jig. I chopped all of the football head shape off, and all that was left was the lead on the shank of the hook. The lead kind of went down the shank of that football jig. I then put it on a jig or a uh, Kitek 3.8 Kitek. I took it out to a local pond. First cast, catch a two pounder. Second cast, catch a pound and a half fish. And I called Matt literally on the phone. I'm like, Matt, I just saw, caught two fish on two casts with this bait I put together in the garage. We need to figure out how to make this happen. Go down the road, we got that bait kind of prototyping going. And Matt sends me a picture and he's like, hey, there's this hover strolling technique. I hover stroll, this is a thing. And he's like, if we put the weight on the shank of the hook and he like tied up this cussing thing and then he pulled over the head and I was like, what are you talking about? And he made a prototype of the hover rig, and I'm like, this is genius. We can make the tush, and then we can have the hover rig. And so we kind of, like, I was kind of doing the tush, Matt was doing the hover rig. We launched both those products, and they just went gangbusters. Like, we, we went into it honestly saying, like, hey, let's put in a little bit of money. If we can sell 10,000 packs total in a year, we would be fantastic. That would be amazing. We sold 10,000 packs within the first, like, month and a half yeah we actually we sold we had two thousand packs of each and we sold out in i think it was like two days three days so we sold yeah. like four thousand packs in like four days the only reason we didn't sell faster is we couldn't get more product more. and it just kept going and after that like it's just been it's been a roller coaster designing baits figuring out the inventory all that stuff we got a great team that's helping us out we got the whole core tackle house now okay so here right here in this part of the podcast johnny just went in depth on how he and matt Got together with Core Tackle, okay? Like I said, a whole audio glitch there happened. I then shared, you know, how I got to listen to them talk about it and how Johnny was always just a guy that just tinkled with baits and just always had designs and drew stuff down, you know? So you missed about two minutes here of Johnny talking about the um, Core Tackle and how it came about. Frog, say, a frog. frog. So as people, uh, like as people know and they don't know, but I tell them, you're the best frog fisherman I know. Like, by hand. Like, people, like, don't get it. And you don't do as much as you used to because no. of where you live. But even when you came to Millwood, it didn't take you long. Well, so I grew up frog fishing. So don't I know. team partner. I, we fished the Fishers of Men when I was in Wisconsin. So uh -huh. I was, like, oh, yeah. eight till I was 12. All we threw was the Zoom horny. To We're talking about something else over here. You're going to be here in the background. We gotta, Those guys give me a hard time. Oh, man. This is, is going to be rough. Anyway, wait, so, till uh, wait till the next podcast where we have everybody in it. And so, just going to let them talk. Oh. And so we so we would fish up north and out there there's lily pads and there's slop and there's yeah. just like just matted grass and so like buffalo lake lake winnicani things like that fox river for anyone's up north they'll know about that my favorite um y'all peanut galleries anyways so uh with with the with those areas we would throw a zoom horny toad on a just weightless hook and we would throw that thing every tournament that's all we would do fishing seasons from like yeah. May through September. So it worked the entire fishing season. Mm -hmm. So I threw a frog 75% of the time in all my tournaments growing up. So that's what I learned and like that's what I knew we could catch good fish on. And when I came to Arkansas, Arkansas River, Lake Dardanelle, all these places, 
I I caught more fish on a frog in tournaments from the time I was 12 to the time I was like 17 than anything else. Now I moved to the offshore game, football, jigs, deep diving, crankbait, stuff like that. But I still love a frog. Like yeah, the frog bite. I know all the nuances. I know all the tricks. Waiting and with the BBs. Like I've been there, done that with all all the frog stuff you can think of. I have a million different. Like I have every color of the Rojas frogs. I got all that stuff. So like the. I'm a big frog guy, but I don't do it as much as I used to. Yeah. If you put it in my hand, I feel like I'm going to be able to put some fish in there. All right. So we're, I know we're here. I don't want to take too much of time with it. We're getting close. All right. Lake. Favorite lake in Arkansas. If you had to fish one lake. In Arkansas. Hard, I know. I bet but probably the time of the year, huh? Two lakes. If I said two lakes, where are they going to be? If I had two lakes. That's going to make it easier because I know, I know you're conflicting right now between Darno and Washita. Well, so this is the thing. Dardanelle has gone downhill from yeah. where it used to be. Yeah, I got word today from some guys that's coming back. So I spent the most time in yeah. Dardanelle tournament wise, and there used to be a lot of pads, a lot of grass, there's all kinds of stuff in there. I know a lot about Dardanelle. I fish a lot in Dardanelle. Washita is a lake, though, where you Washita. can go out and you can get lost. And you can go fish all kinds of different water. You can go fish in the mud up the river, clean water, grass, sandy mm-hmm. timber. Anything you want on Washita. Mm-hmm. And that lake has just been good to me over the years. So I would say it's Washita, it's pretty, it's beautiful. Dardanelle, it's hard, it's challenging, but you can get into little key zones, like the size of like this couch. Yep. And you can absolutely load the boat. And I love that too, where like you grind for six hours, nothing. And then you get in one stretch, one little key deal, and you have 15 to 18 pounds like that. I There's something about that too that like really was fun. Again, a lot of frog fishing, crankbaits, jigs. <laughs> Dude, you're so dialed in on Darnell when you, like I said, you won that regional. So you're preparing for that regional. I tell people this. I'm going to put it out there on the podcast. But you uh, you were so dialed in. I remember coming up and fishing two trips with you. But you knew when the current was, of course, going to go, when they were going to be on these shell beds or these hard spots with brush piles. And, like, you know, we would fish We'd fish the frog early. And you're like, if we get one over four or five pounds, it's a bonus. And we would do it for one hour. And the two times I did it with you, we didn't catch one, but you you did it some other days, and maybe even in that tournament. But um, then we did the offshore thing. You would graph, see, we'd see the the shad, see it around, and you were just like, "Hey, when the current goes, it's all gonna happen. They're gonna be up here. Trust me." And I remember the first time I got to experience it, and like we pulled up to the first spot, like ten forty five, six pounder, five pounder, and I was just like, "This what?" And then we went to the next spot. Boom, boom. And I was just like, okay. And you did that for like a month straight or whatever your practice time was. You did it for it. Then tournament time came. And you were kind of like, from what I remember, I don't know where to even go because you had the whole lake dialed. But you found them during the tournament, right? Yeah, so the spot I caught them was the spot. Actually, I, I finished second in the weekend uh, tournament. It was a Saturday tournament. I was, I was fishing in a team tournament, but I fished by myself. That's it. So I finished second. I had 19 and a half pounds. Then the regionals the next day. Next uh, next weekend was the regionals. And actually, I had a guy that, um, uh, one of my buddies, He his brother was fishing the night tournament, and he kind of knew where the spot was. And my buddy, who's a longtime friend, he actually hole jacked me first day morning. Was yeah, like, that's he was right. Sitting on my spot that I found. It was out in the middle of the river. I grabbed it was a shell bed. No one knew about this. Like, no one was fishing this little deal until it, some people knew about it, but it was like a real sneak hole. And he was sitting right on my spot. And so I was like, man, I'm not going to be bothered. And I actually went up the river, and I've been catching them offshore and everything. And I started fishing shallow uh, coontail and fishing the top water. And I caught, like, a limit of fish throw it doing that. And I'm like, the current's not going to run till 11. I'm just going to let that guy fish there and not catch anything for four hours. And I pulled back up on that shell bed, and it was just a little key one cast deal. And he was there, but he, was, he had moved off away from it. And I pulled in. Boom, 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 boom. Five casts. Caught like, I think we had like 18 pounds at that point. And I left, and the current stopped. It only was running for two hours. We were there for like an hour and a half. Caught him, left. My buddy pulled in, tried to catch him, didn't catch anything. Then we run to a community hole, and I was using a bait also that no one was throwing other than a few guys, which is the hair jig. No, oh, your hair jig. And I was catching him on Lake Dardanelle on a hair jig. And we didn't have like the real hair jigs back then. I was using a striper hair jig. <laughs> it was a striper hair jig, like two ninety nine half pounds hair jig. And I was burning it, popping it, and I caught a four and three quarter pounder on a hair jig off this one little uh, road bed thing. But yeah, the that's the thing about fishing tournaments and stuff is time on the water and lake knowledge are critical if you want to be a good local 
late angler. Like mm -hmm. I was super dialed on Dardanelle then year round. I would do well, you know, every single season of the year. I was fishing it a ton. And I don't fish as much as I used to back then. And I don't fish one lake as much as I used to. I try to go to random lakes and yeah. bounce around. Because I just find it more fun for content. I like to just fish one lake. I probably fish each lake I fish, I'll fish it one time every two months. Yeah. I go to a new lake every week. I fish like once a week now. Mm -hmm. But I'll go to a different lake because I like that challenge. But if you're getting discouraged in your local derbies and guys are catching fish and stuff like that, one, they have a lot of experience on the lake. Two, they're out there a lot. And three, there's a lot of days when those guys go out and they don't catch anything, but they keep trying new things yeah. and keep pushing and they grind through those tough, tough times to get to the point where they're really good. So, like, everyone pays their dues. Maybe not so much now with, you know, those live scopers. I'm yeah, sorry. sometimes I'm I live kidding. scopers. But uh, other than that, we're just, I'm just messing with that. Yeah. Part. That's what people are saying. But it is it is time on the water is most critical. And that's what I know with you, you're 10 times better fisherman mm -hmm. now than two years ago when yep. you started working fishing the moment. Like, you could fish circles around your old self right now. Yeah. Just the time on the water. 100% like and like I learned so much from you on like you're like hey when you're making content you need to find new fish fish new areas you will learn and you're gonna have a struggle and that fall of 2022 I struggled I thought about quitting and going back to coaching but I was like I'm not gonna do it because I never fished in the fall except the one fall of COVID when COVID happened and, and Millwood was fire and that's another reason why I was fire but like I never had like lake experience because I was coaching and playing football and then I was like, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to figure out live scope. And, you know, that was part of my beginnings of, like, legit learning it. And I was like, I'm going to keep my head down. But even, like, today I had somebody ask me that's an Arkansas, you know, I'm running some Arkansas guys, and this one angler who's a hammer, I mean, in, in Arkansas, and he's like, why are you not fishing tournaments? And I told him, dude, not right now. I was like, oh, there was a time I'm going to. Because that competition side, you always had it with coaching. This guy's a star QB. Oh, I mean, oh, that's I was so at his, I was oh, at his final scene. You were at, dude, you and your dad were the first guys I saw off the field <laughs> when I lost, and we lost that playoff game. It was a semifinal playoff game. But, like, um, but like, so I had the, you know, that was my, I always had the competition and coaching, but now I don't. I told him, I was like, hey, give me, I was like, hey, I have my two young kids. My, I was like, I, I kind of want to, I'm lucky to be on the water. I was like, but just wait. I just said, you know, I'm, because he was like, dude, you're on the water a lot. He goes, you're on the water. As, you know, me and you are like the two guys on the water most. I go, oh, I know. I was like, I just give me some time. I was like, I, you know, I'll get there. But yeah. anyway, guys, appreciate it. Thank you, Johnny. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cool Tackle Team, for letting us have the podcast. Any uh, word from the peanut gallery? Yeah. Well, Matt's gone. The rowdy one's already out. It's so quiet. Good. It's quiet now when Matt yeah, left. That's good. We'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, hey, we're going to have another podcast tomorrow, guys, all right? Yeah. Appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow.